Hey, how's everybody doing? Welcome back to the channel. I'm Rochelle Emerson. It is a typical October morning. It was really foggy this morning. But I'm continuing this series on Elaine uh, Warnos, uh, America's first female serial killer. And this is kind of like an anniversary. Uh, she was executed in uh, 2002. She went on trial in 1992, so it's been 25 years. And happy Halloween month to everybody. There you go. There's a little Halloween, Halloween stuff there. All the kids are looking forward to all of that. So, yeah, 25 years. And I'm fascinated with this case, just like a lot of other people. And I just thought I would do this. And I never sat and watched a trial. I'm probably like everybody else where you go and find the documentaries and you just want to get the highlights and, you know, and then you get the backstory and all of this good stuff. But I wanted to sit and actually watch the trial. So today I am going to go over... Um, it's in two parts, so we're going to do this in two videos where her direct from the prosecution, she takes the stand. Now, I haven't researched, I'm like, why did she take the stand? We all know you don't have to take the stand and all this kind of good stuff. So I'm not really sure. Um, I haven't checked into that yet. Uh, in fact, all the stuff I've looked at, nobody has said anything about it. Like, why, why did she take the stand? Um, I'm curious about the, the psychiatrists and stuff. You know how we just watched the boy in the box case, and you had a psychiatrist for both sides and, and this kind of thing, but did they have that for this? I don't know. I'm still diving into the trial itself, and there's a lot of stuff going on. Let me know in the comments because I think... Obviously, they had a ham they had quite a few witnesses and stuff, but it was like the police officers and all that. And one of those is like two hours long. I don't know if that's even if anybody's interested in sitting through that, or either I'd have to watch it and just clip out the highlights of questioning and his answers, uh, kind of thing. There was a couple of police officers, the detective. Um, I need to dig through and find the psychiatrist, like, because clearly she was psychotic. She's crazy. And I feel like she shouldn't have been executed. She should have been put in, in the lack of a better term, a loony bin, right? That's what we all used to call it back in the day. But she should have been put in a mental facility. She was, she was crazy. She's had a, her life started out tragic. We all know that, which I'm going to be doing. A, I'm going to do like a documentary and compile uh, st stuff like that and, um, and look at her childhood and how all this might have impacted her, psych her psyche, her psychosis. But anyway, we're going to get into her... Um, her direct from the prosecution, uh, and she takes the stand, which is just crazy. Okay. So, I haven't seen this. Now, on the uh, Court TV archive footage of trials, there's two parts. So, I don't know... If this whole thing, this is an hour and 16 minutes long, uh, and the prosecution starts out on direct, so I am not sure if we're going to get a redirect in this, or if it's going to be on the, the part two that's in the file archives. I'm going to try not to talk through it, unless something crazy goes on and I'm compelled to stop and, and make a comment, but... Some people like commentary a lot, and some people don't. But I haven't seen it, and I wanted to absorb uh, as much as I can 
while I'm watching this. So either I'm just going to save my commentary for the end or if they get breaks, which I know I noticed on the other two that I've done that uh, Court TV is edited out when uh, they've taken lunch breaks and this kind of thing. So we'll see how it runs. We'll just see how it goes. But uh, let's get into this. Elaine Wardos' direct from the prosecution. Whatever you want to. Are we ready to proceed on our motion for directing the or whatever motion things may happen? Yes, Judge. Not to make any assumptions. Judge, I'm going to ask the bottom of the panel to include that to be free to the bench. Judge, we, we discussed the issue at the bench. We made a formal request that Dr. McMahon be allowed to be present in the courtroom today to observe uh, some of the testimony as it would be relevant to her consideration of issues in the case and possibly would be relevant to explaining uh, the subject matter of the testimony and what's perceived. Uh, I think Your Honor agreed with Mr. Zamor's objection to that procedure. Uh, we, we think it's... Uh, it would be significant under age for the defense to have Dr. McMahon present in the courtroom, but then also it would be monitored. The rule was the rule will be in court. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think, the, I think, yeah, I think the next step, Your Honor, is for the, the state had a set of the semi breath yesterday. We need a, a formal one. We can do that in front of the jury. Uh, are, are you uh, ready? Totally rest now. Yes, sir. Stay ready to rest. Your Honor, at this time, we would renew previous motions. Renew all previous requests for mistrial. Renew all previous objections and applications that the defense has made. I don't. I don't know if the court would like to have argument on all of those. It would be the same as made at the time they were proposed. Right? <clears throat> Pretty much. Okay. Well, now see, I haven't seen this, so I was under the impression that it was the prosecution, but the prosecution has rested, and the defense is. Pulling her up. So, hey, <laughs> I didn't know. I just assumed because it said it was in two parts that the prosecution. So now we're just going to see the prosecution on direct. But, but this is uh, on redirect. My bad. But this is direct. Uh, the this the defense calling her up. All right, let's do this. Stay the line from the same word as her. Yes, sir. <laughs> One additional matter is to the Williams rule evidence, Your Honor. We would ask the court to reconsider and to grant the mistrial with regard to the Williams rule issue. And the reason for that is that although the court initially ruled on the state's uh, request that the Williams rule evidence be introduced, um, what the court subsequently heard is the Williams rule evidence becoming a feature of this trial. I dare say that the majority of this trial had nothing to do with Mr. Ballard. Given that, we would submit that the Williams rule question in this case has gone beyond the bounds of the proper admission of Williams rule evidence, and we would formally request a mistrial at this point. Mr. Moore, Your Honor, I think we made this argument before the state's involved and conformed with what we explained before we were proceeding. So, specifically to the intent of this defendant to murder Mr. Mallory, as well as the lack of any self defense claim, as well as also the proof of the use of the murder weapon in this case. Those reasons, Judge, and all others that were argued before this court, we respectfully wow. submit that the William Rule testimony was properly admitted, did not become a feature of this case, and based upon the defense raised uh, by the defendant uh, through counsel, through cross examination, and an opening statement, uh, the state uh, put the proper amount of William Rule testimony before the jury, and this court should not a motion for mistrial. Motion for mistrial denied. Your Honor, at this time, we would formally move for a judgment of acquittal on this witness' behalf. Uh, and there are some, there are different reasons for that motion. Let me try to take them one at a time. The first reason would be that the state has failed to prove or establish the identity of the decedent. Your Honor has heard a great deal of uh, 
evidence of varying degrees of materiality introduced by the state of Florida during the course of the proceedings. What the record of this case does not reflect is an identification of the, of, of the decedent as Mr. Mallory. Corpus selecti in that sense has not been established. Uh, you've heard testimony that uh, the decedent's hands were sent off to Tallahassee. You've never heard any evidence about a fingerprint. You've never heard any evidence about somebody identifying uh, the decedent in this case sufficient to establish corpus selecti. And that would be the, the first request for motion from this trial. Uh, for judgment of the court, Go ahead, maybe. Yeah, you want to do them all? Oh, okay. Sure. The second, Your Honor, would be that there has been insufficient evidence presented on the issue of robbery. Taking the evidence in the light most favorable to the state, looking at the evidence in the light most favorable to the prosecution's presentation, what you have in this case is a state theory predicated on a premeditated murder. That's what the state is arguing. The state has not presented any evidence of robbery. Under the law, one cannot commit a robbery against the decedent. And so even if the state's evidence is taken at face value, what you have here is a decedent from whom property was taken. That is insufficient to establish robbery. And we would move the judgment and put on robbery and on felony murder uh, under that uh, part. Do you have a case on that, sir? I, I don't have it with me, but I do know there are, there are a bunch of cases on that issue, Your Honor. Um, I, I can get them for you by the end of the day if you'd like. Or, or maybe Mr. No. He should already have that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> I will present the court with a case directly on the point with that. It's exactly the opposite of what counsel represents. He's citing this old case law that was done prior to change the law. Uh, where the court indicated that he could not allow the dead man. This is the judge. I think the facts firmly uh, that this man was dead by some outside agency other than this warrant, and then his property was taken. Here uh, was done directly by Ms. Warnock to Mr. Mallory in the perpetration of the robbery. The fact that he may have been dead or languishing, he robbed him of his property and took his car and his money and rummaged through his pocket. Simply got cold water and looking at nice what I'll tell you, Your Honor, there are cases on those. I don't have it right in front of me. I can't say it as we proceed here. Finally, Your Honor, we would move for judgment of acquittal on the, well, we would also move for judgment of acquittal on various predicate issues. Those have been raised during the course of the proceedings, and Your Honor has ruled on those. I know that Your Honor wants to elaborate on those at this time. And then, Your Honor, we would also submit even taking the evidence in the light most favorable to the state, the state had not established premeditated murder in this case. Uh, you have a great deal of evidence relating other, to other deceits that the state has presented. Uh, there is also evidence that Mr. Mallory um, died. However, all taking the evidence in the light most favorable to the state, Ms. Warnes did indicate that the decedent was acting violently towards her. Taking the evidence as far as what happened at the time of the decedent's death in the light most favorable to the state, you do not have a case of first degree murder. You do not have a case of premeditation. Uh, you may have a lesser degree of homicide, but on that issue of premeditation, a first degree case had not been made out. Um, with those arguments and renewing our previous objections and our previous motions, um, and on state and federal constitutional grounds, we would request the trial reconsider your previous rulings and grant the judgment of a at this time as either as to uh, the entirety of the indictment or as to the highest grade crimes charged in the indictment. Is that all, sir? Ed. I think so, sir. All right, sir. Your Honor, very briefly, the state of Mr. Burton's case uh, amply before the law. Looking at the evidence the light most favorable to say that this matter should be presented to the jury, the defense should be required to go forward. We'd ask that the motion be denied on all basis. Oh, no rebuttal, sir. The only testimony is within the security for a time that the state of the patient pays security questions for the direct testimony. All other orders in the court. Uh, thank you, Judge. 
Um, we have the matter relating to Ms. Davis, which we'll take up subsequently. Yes, sir. Um, is Davis the last name? Yes. <laughs> Judge, can, can, can we just approach on that for just one second? Any further? Yes, Your Honor, there are a couple of additional applications. <clears throat> Ms. Warnes will be testifying today. In that regard, there are certain applications we need to clear up in advance uh, relating to potential cross-examination. We would first request that the state of Florida not engage in any cross-examination relating to statements that Ms. Wernos may have made to experts appointed by the court for the state of Florida. As Your Honor knows, those experts were seen by Ms. Wernos under court order. Wernos had to speak to those experts. If it would be improper, we would submit for her to be cross-examined when testifying as to those statements. They're compelled. Statements are a classic example of compelled testimony because they were done compelled statements because they were done under court. So that would be our first application. The state may not intend to get into that, but I thought that would be something that would be wisest to take up in advance uh, so that we can have some sort of plan as to where we're going. I'm just going to borrow trouble to arrive. So I need to read the <laughs> Yes, Judge. <Jennifer. laughs> The second area in that regard would be statements that Ms. Wernos may or may not have made to defense experts. Again, we have not opened the door to those types of issues at this juncture. Again, there's nothing for the representation counsel on principles. Finally, Your Honor, we would also request that the state not cross examine Ms. Wernos on, <coughs> as attorneys, we all know what these are, on classically impermissible areas, such as remorse and issues along those lines. I assume Your Honor is going to say we'll cross that bridge when we get to it as well. A attorney lawyer, so. With a little court. Yes, Judge. Ms. Wernus, we understand, has one felony conviction that both parties are aware of that the state will be employing, uh, I assume, on cross examination. And I'm trying to think of what else of the preliminary matter there is. <laughs> Yes, Judge. Actually, there is there is one additional matter. As Your Honor knows from, from the many lengthy days of Williams Rule testimony that you've heard here, uh, there are other pending indictments in reference to Ms. Warnes. There are other cases, some of which three attorneys before you represent her on. We have advised and will advise Ms. Warnes to assert her Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights in reference to those cases. We would submit that it is highly prejudicial and very inflammatory for the state on cross-examination because we are here on the Mallory case to inquire as to those other cases. We would also submit that having a procedure by which the Fifth Amendment is asserted before the jury uh, is unnecessary and prejudicial. And since we are representing at this juncture that that is what Ms. Warnos will do on our advice, that it would be improper for the state to ask the question. The only reason to ask questions relating to other cases would be to get the answer we all know that's going to come, namely that the Fifth Amendment will be asserted. And we would request that that area not be touched on during the process. I'm not saying who all the only convictions should be addressed. I will rule the court. What I'm saying is it's one thing for the question to be asked, smoke the hit the air, and your honor to rule. It's another thing to get the rule that hits the air. What I'm saying is it should not hit the area, Your Honor, because it would be highly unfair to do that. Do that for the ethics and the attorneys. Yes, Judge. That's it, Your Honor. Yes, sir. I don't think they should bring in the others. This trial was on uh, Richard Mallory. I mean, I kind of agree with the defense that it would be presidential to her uh to uh bring up that other stuff we've seen in other trials that they don't allow it i mean and then we're thinking why didn't you allow it you know they did this this and that because i mean it's not relevant to this particular case yeah she's guilty don't misunderstand i know but i'm kind of agreeing with the defense that it shouldn't be brought up they should just it should be just focused on what she's being tried for in this particular case. 
Your Honor, we have uh, until about 9.45. Well, 9.45 or I think the jury coming in at 9.30. We'd like to have a little additional time for the announcement and the we were in deposition last night until well after dark. Feel the incredible song. Does anybody know when they stopped having people swear swear to God and put their hand on the Bible? I've noticed that, that they haven't been doing that at all. Oh man, here we go. Please state your full name for the record. I'm Lynn Warnus. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. It's, if you can't hear me at any time, let me know. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I uh, would also ask him if you speak loudly enough, and you want to hear you. Okay. Can you, you, you might need to come a little closer to the microphone. <laughs> okay. How old are you? Thirty-five. Uh, where are you from? Troy, Michigan. When did you leave home or come to Florida? About around 14 years old. Where had you been living just prior to being 14 years old when you decided to come to Florida? I was living in Troy, Michigan. Okay. With your family? Yes. Uh, why did you come to Florida? Because when I was younger and I was living out in the streets, I was sleeping in the snow and all. It was too cold. And I had to come to Florida where it was warmer weather and seek warmer shelter. Okay. How did you come to Florida? I hitchhiked. Did you come with a friend or how did you come? By myself. How did you support yourself during those early years? Well, I had a couple jobs for 75 cents an hour, but I basically was a prostitute. When did you start becoming a prostitute, lady? At the age of 16. And how did that happen? How did you end up getting into that particular profession? Well, there was a, when I was hitchhiking, a lot of guys would pick me up and they'd ask me if I wanted to make some money. And they'd give me like 60 or $100, and back in them days, a $2, you could get a $2 meal for, yeah, you know, I mean, a cheap meal. So it was really good money. I was only making 75 cents an hour, and it was excellent money to help me because I was on the road. And so I took the offer, and that's where I became a hitchhiking prostitute. Were you always in Florida doing that? Were you always no, I was all over the United States. And how old were you when you finally came to, to Florida to settle? Do you remember? So yes, I was about, um, well, I was 16 when I came to Florida. Mm -hmm. But I mean, to settle, to just settle, mm -hmm. I was about 20. Have you ever had children? Yes, I have one son. And how old are you then? He should be about 21 How or 22. Old you when you had oh, I was uh, 14. And did you give the child up, or what happened? Yeah, you're all irrelevant. Uh, my grandmother made me give the child up. My parents, my grandmother and grandfather. You thought of your grandparents as your parents? Yes, they adopted me. How often over the last few years, let's start four or five years ago, how often would you go out during the week to, to hustle on the highways? Just previously? Let's say the last four or five years. Well, I would go out to about anywhere from three to three to seven days. It depended. It basically four days out of week for sure. And how many men would you say you have contact with during the course of the day? Hmm. 
I would say I had at least anywhere from three to eight. It depended. It varied, but definitely three a day at least. I mean, but it varied. I could have six. I could have eight. And not all of those contact or those contact sexual. Yes, those are sexual contact. Okay. And uh, did you have contacts made on the road that weren't sexual? Or oh just yeah, a ride? every day, at least at least eight to fifteen, because <laughs> I worked from exit to exit. Okay, explain that you worked from exit to exit. Well, uh, I would leave Daytona. And there's times I'd spend the whole day on the road or, or the whole night, and I'd stay two or three days gone. And I just worked from one exit to the other. If a guy would pick me up and he wasn't interested, now, so a lot of guys asked me too. I didn't have to ask them. And if they were interested, fine. But if they weren't, I'd just get off the next exit and try again. Uh, there came a time when you met Ty, mm -hmm. Tyree Moore. Mm -hmm. When was that? 1986 and, and describe the relationship with Todd. Well, um, I met her at the Zodiac and from the very first day I met her, we fell head over heels with each other and uh, at the first year we were pretty, you know, kind of sexual, but we the second year and the third year and on, we became like sisters, and I loved her very deeply. She loved me very deeply, but we didn't care about the sex part anymore. We just cared about each other. We were really, really close, like a knot, like a tied like a rope, like a knot on a rope. Uh, did your, uh, I'm going to call it, that's what you call it, your hustling, uh, stop once you got into the relationship with Ty? No, she... Matter of fact, she quit her job at Al Karib. Uh, the, the first m month that I was with her, she quit her job because I told her I make $150 a day or better, and you only make $150 a week. So if you want to quit, I'll support you. And she was all for it, and she continued to support me like a cheerleader. She wanted me out there. She told me all the time to go out and make more money. We know that's not what she said when Ty was on the stand. Ty said she didn't want her to do it. Y'all remember that? Did you begin to go out more often? Is there kind of time you started? Well, the, the last year she didn't like the trailer living, and she just constantly was telling me that I wasn't providing enough for her, that she wanted me to go out there and make more money because she wanted me to get a pressure cleaner business again and also get a house for her, everything else. So she said, I want you to go out there more often. She was pretty much like my pimp, it seemed like I was a white slave. I didn't realize it, but she'd tell me to go on out there. If I didn't, she was going to break up with me and find another girl that would definitely take care of her. And I loved her to the max and I wasn't going to do that. Did you talk about your experiences on the road with her? Um, not really. Why not? She, she didn't want to hear it. She'd never, she always told me not to talk to her about it. She didn't care what happened to me out there. Did you try to talk to her about Richard now? Yeah, I did, but she didn't want to listen. And during the times that you were uh, with Ty, did she ever work? Uh, Tyra worked when I first met her, Al Karib. Then she quit a month. I took care of her, and then she worked for a couple times at separate motels. I mean, separate Hills Motel, but she didn't get any money. That was for board, so I took care of her there. The only solid job she ever had, make, she was a laundry worker for two months, and that didn't work long, so forget that. Uh, the only solid job she had was uh, Casa Del Mar the last year. She was making like about 300 every two weeks, or 277, something like that. And was she working when you two split up? No. Had she quit her job? She got fired. You know why? She beat up her boss. So during these periods of time, were you supporting her? 
Uh, yes. What, what are you spending your money on? Oh, well, well, see, I wanted to save up for like a house and a pressure cleaner and everything else. And every time I came home with money, she always wanted to go to the mall, buy clothes. I never bought clothes for myself. I, I had a bra even that had band-aids on it and safety pin and everything. I mean, I never could, I always, I just took care of her. I didn't really seem to want to care about myself. I just took care of my, her and bought her a lot of clothes and everything. And a lot of times she just go to the bars and we go to fancy restaurants and bars and we blew it all in basically bars. I mean, $100, I saw her spend three, $200 in a quarter machine for stuffed, stuffed animals in one night, just done quarters in the machine. She, she, whatever she wanted, she got it. I, I loved her very much. Did you like to drink too? Yes, I drank. Did you drink a lot? Just as much as her. We always kept even. We always made sure we, we were drinking the same amount. So. One wouldn't have more than the other. We, we, that's how close we were. We, we did everything together. Would you drink when you were out on the road working? <laughs> yeah, I drank about, I'd say anywhere from two to six beers, sometimes more, sometimes less. Why would you drink out on the road? Well, it was like my tranquilizer. I was shy and hard to sometimes i was just shy i was embarrassed about my body because i had a whipped um, i was just shy and it, it was my tranquilizer and the plus i was scared out there sometimes i was nervous and but i knew that that was my profession it's the only thing i could do so did you accept rides with men of all ages yes i did it yeah but but the young guys I decided not to deal with because I've learned throughout time that they were always high, they were always stoned on or something, and, and they just seemed a little more like aggressive and like a violent attitude or something. I, don't, I didn't trust them. And they always were stoned or something. And I don't do drugs, so. Prior to uh, meeting Richard Mallory, had you ever been hurt while you were out working on the road? Yes. Can you tell us about that? <clears throat> well, I had twice I had uh, mace guns and they got those away from me and beat me up pretty bad and raped me. And then I had this bullfighter mace that a friend of mine gave me. And your honor to the Question not specifying some kind of time frame or time of reference. Uh, later, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Within the last five years, starting with the first time, within the last five years, we'll go back later. Uh, if you would tell the jury about any instances and where you were living when these occurred. Okay. Uh... I was living with Tyra and, and Oleander, and it was, you want the year or something? If, if you recall the year. Yes, it was in 86 and 87 and 88. And um, also there was a couple of guys that raped me without any weapon, and I got hurt on that and everything. When you were a young girl, just starting out, were you ever physically hurt while you were out on the road? And if, if you were, again, tell us where you were and how old you were. Okay, I was hurt a couple of times. Um, there was this guy in Jeffersonville, Indiana. He was a third degree karate and judo, and judo instructor and a school seventh grade school teacher. And I met him in a lounge and um he beat me up so bad he, you couldn't describe my face and i got away from him when i finally got help and the police arrived they told me that he he raped a police officer's daughter and disfigured her face so bad you couldn't describe it and that he'd killed two teenagers and they were in the backyard of his house buried in cement <clears throat> that was lucky 
I got away and it took me about, well, I did a report and everything, and but I don't know what happened. If they were just beating them up with flashlights and everything else and told me not to say anything. Which, I was beat up. It took me about two months to recover. I still had yellow and purple and everything on my face. Why didn't you quit working the roads after you've been hurt? Because it was my only way I could, well, see, like I tried to get churches to help me, and they told me I had to be a part of the congregation, and they wouldn't help me. I tried to be a police officer when I was 20 years old. They told me I had to have $3,000 for tuition and um, that uh, then they'd send me to some academy or something like that. I, I didn't have my GED. Then I tried to be a correctional officer here in Daytona, and they told me I had to have a car. I didn't have a car. I only had a bicycle. Um, then I tried the Salvation Army. They told me I can only crash at their place for one day out of every 364 years. You can only stay one night. Now, I tried and tried and tried to help myself. I joined, I took the aptitude berry test for the Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marines, and I missed by three to five points every time. And I thought that would help me get off the road by just going into the government military field, and I didn't pass. That took me two years because you got to wait six months every time to take the aptitude battery test. And so the only thing I, had, I could do was be a prostitute and live off of. It, I lived here and there and everywhere. But I had apartments that one time, but then I lost them and stuff. And Do you remember catching a ride with Richard Mallory? Oh, yes. Do you remember, when did you meet him? It was at the end of November. Of what year? 1989. Where were you when you first I was on I-4 underneath an I-75 I overpass. And describe the first meeting that you had with him. Well, I was coming from Fort Myers. I had spent a couple nights there. The second night <clears throat> I left Fort Myers, I left about 5.30, 6 o'clock. And it took me about six rides to get to I-4. I finally arrived at I-4. It was raining. So I walked off. I mean, yeah, I walked to I, down the ramp to I-4. Mm -hmm. It was raining. So I got underneath the bridge, and it was... Wait, I was waiting for it to stop raining, and I was pretty much off into the... Where the... By dock, I think you call her, with that slab of cement. Mm -hmm. I was uh, right under there, away from the vehicles, because when they were passing, it was spraying rain all over me. So I was over there waiting for it to stop raining. Then I, it slowed down and I decided I was going to walk toward the light. There was a big light out there. I was going to walk under it so they could tell, you know, what if I was a girl or a guy or, you know, what I was. And as I started to walk, a vehicle pulled over before I even get, got past the bridge. And then it start, its lights came on and started backing toward me. And a, I didn't know if it was a bunch of guys in the car or what, but anyway, a car, a vehicle passed, and its headlights went on in the vehicle, and I saw one head, so I felt all right, walked up to the car. I op opened the door, and I said, D did you stop for me? And he said, yeah. Are you going to Orlando? I said, no, I'm going to Daytona. He said, oh, wow, you're a lucky day, man, because I'm going all the way to Daytona. I said, oh, wow, this is great. So I got in the car. And we proceeded down the road. Let me ask you something, Lee. At this time, the time that you met um, mm -hmm. Richard Mallory, had you started carrying a gun? I carried the gun six months before, at least, for four months. Some I can't really recall when, but it was in Rutland when I got the, the pistol. Okay. And why were you carrying a gun? For strictly protection. If you will, describe your uh, your trip with Ms., uh, Mr. Mallory from the time he picked you up until, let's, let's say, for Orlando. Okay. <clears throat> All right, when you mean when he picked me up and now we're going? 
down the road. Okay. Uh, just if you will, were you having a conversation with him? Yes. Okay. Can you tell us about that. All right. So when he picked me up, he asked me, you know, where I saw Tom Daytona. I was really glad and everything. We started down the road. He asked me if I wanted to drink. He, he had some kind of, I didn't know what it was. I just saw tox, tonic bottles and then I thought it said Smirnoff. I'm not sure. And he asked me if I wanted to drink. And um, and then I asked him, I said, well, what is it? And he says, vodka. And I said, all right. And I think he had orange juice. And I said, sure, I'll take a drink, you know. So he made, he pulled over and he made me a drink. And then we started back on the road. And then he asked me if I wanted to smoke some marijuana. I said, no, I, my hands swell, my feet swell, my heart beats a mile a minute. I can't stand it, but, it, you know, you smoke it, that's your business. And he said, well, then you don't mind. I said, it's your car. I don't care what you do. It's up to you. And he said, okay. So he's smoking marijuana and going down the road. And then he asked me what I did. And I told him I'm, I'm in the pressure cleaning. And I asked him what he did. He said he had a video store that he owned and <clears throat> that he was on his way to Daytona. He's going to, he was telling me about his video store. He was on his way to Daytona to see some topless bars, and if I knew any girls out there that would be interested in pornography films, that he'd give two to $3,000 an hour for these sessions. And I told him, I don't know anybody. I'm into pressure cleaning, and I, don't, I only got one girlfriend that I know, and I know she wouldn't be interested, so sorry, I can't help you there. And so we just talked about anything, politics, religion. We talked about his store a lot. And still on the sex part now and then, but I just I told him I don't know anybody constantly on that. So finally arrived to Orlando, and he asked me if I wanted any beer instead of the mixed drink because I had told him that I I haven't I don't drink mixed drinks that much, and that I haven't had a mixed drink in about ten years it seems. Had you had any other alcohol that day? Yeah, so I drank. I, I drank beer in Fort Myers. I just came out of the office pub on my way back to Daytona. See, I had made around $300, and I only had about 250 or 60 left, and I didn't want to blow it because I had to get back and get that apartment. That, okay. So uh, what did you do once you got to Orlando? Okay, so when I got to Orlando, he went ahead and he bought a six-pack for me. I think it was Bush. He asked me if I want to pack cereals. I said, no, thank you. I've got some already. And then uh, he just got a little more gas, and we went down the road. We got past Orlando, and we had to stop, go to the bathroom. So we got out and went to the bathroom. Then I got back in. We were talking about, he was talking about his wife or his ex-wife. I don't remember if he was married or not married or nothing, but he was talking about having problems with this lady. It was he was worried about losing his video store and he was losing his business. He's gonna lose his house, he's gonna lose his car, he's gonna lose everything. And I don't know if he was married or not. Did you proposition him? No. Why not? Because I was too exhausted and everything. I had enough money and I just wanted to get home. All I wanted to do was get get home. All I cared about. It was late. It was about eleven thirty when he picked me up. Uh, at night. So tell us what happened next. Okay, so anyway, then it's buffering. We talk to a lot of married people. He's but I just can't, man. You're just like a psychologist or a counselor. I mean, you get you're you're a good listener and you also give good advice. I said, well, thank you. You know, <laughs> and then he said, he said, do you mind if we just kind of stop somewhere and talk for a little while? I'd like to, you know listen to your advice and stuff, you know, you're, you're helping me and stuff. And I said, well, I really want to get home. You know, I'm really tired and everything. And I've been hitchhiking for so long. And he said, he said, well, I mean, you know, just, let's just go talk for an hour or something. I mean, I'll, I'll take you home. And I said, well, it's getting pretty late. If I, if I um, go home, the dog's going to, I don't have a key on me. If I go home, the dog's going to start barking. The, the manager lives right next door, and I'm going to have to wake up Ty in the middle of the night. She has to go to work early in the morning. Cassie Del Mar, she was still working. So I said, well, I guess I wouldn't mind stopping and talking to you because I've got to pass a little time anyway. I'm going to have to wait till in the morning. I don't know what I'm going to do. I might even have to 
you know, I mean, get a motel or something. I don't know what I'm going to do because it's too late for me to, I don't want Maggie to wake up manager because he's already in the mood to kick us out. Okay. So um, then he said, well, okay, I'll give you a lift home. I said, well, great. Then that's going to save me on taxi money too. So he said, all right. He said, well, where do you live around? I said, well, you got to get off at US-1, and then you go to Granada. You take Granada over to A1A, and then you go north. And I live at the Ocean Shores, I think it was called, motel. So then um, he, we continued. We decided, OK, I'd stop. So he got off at, off a nine, uh, I-4 to 95, went north, got to US-1, got off, and he parked at a gas station. How long had it taken you to get to that point from when he first picked you up, you know? It was about two and a half hours from okay. Daytona. Yeah, when he first picked hours. you up until you got to this place where he stopped to get your gas. At yeah. the gas station, I guess. Yeah, I'd say two and a half hours. Okay. All right, so what happened after you stopped that time? Okay, so then I, he said, well, where can we park? And I said, well, well, anywhere, you know, this is fine. You can park right there if you want to. And he said, no, I'm smoking pot and I don't want to get busted. And plus we got all this booze and stuff and, you know, a patrol car comes by. And I said, well, if you go north up here, there's a whole lot of places there's up here. And there's a, even Quail Run. They've got like a subdivision up there and it's out near Benal. And it's really quiet up there if you want to go there. So he said, okay, let's go and check that place out. So... We went over there, and we're sitting there talking, and we talked for at least, I'd say, an hour and a half, two hours, just talking about everything. He still asked me about the chronos and all that stuff, and I said, no, no, no. Feel the incredible softness and warmth. Were you drinking? Yes. We, I was drinking beer. He was drinking his mixed drinks, and he was still smoking his pot. God, he, I couldn't believe he was smoking so much pot. I even asked him what kind it was eventually, and he said Sensimilli, and I, I've heard Sensimilli is a heavy pot, so I couldn't believe it. But he was handling it, and he was doing all right. And um, so then um, we were talking away and everything, and, oh, okay, so he asked me, how come if you know married people, you're, you know, you're so good at counseling and everything, if you know married people so well, you told me you're single and you have a roommate, how can you know so many married people? And I finally told him, I said, that's, I guess I'm going to have to explain to you, Richard, because you're being so honest with me and I'm going to be honest with you. I said, I'm, I'm, a, hus I'm a hooker. I hustle for a living. And he said, hustle, you mean a sex? And I said, yeah, it was a sex. Mm -hmm. okay. So then he, um, he said, well, God, I thought I was going to, we were going to get it on. I mean, eventually get it on together, but you don't do it. Free, you probably, you, you do it for money, right? I said, that's right, I do it for money. He said, so you don't, you don't do it for free, right? I said, no, I don't. This is my job. This is what I do for a living. And so he, what would you do next after you had that conversation with him? Then he asked me how much I charge, and I said, said 30 for head, 35 straight, 40 for half and a half, 100 an hour. And he said, and I said, well, 100 an hour, I don't usually, you know, make the person well, after an hour's up, I don't say, well, you got to give me another $100. If the guy's all right, you know, I'm just staying with him. We become friends. I just, thanks a lot, because I only want enough for rent and whatever. I don't care about it. I'm not greedy. I don't care about making any more. A hundred's fine. It's good enough for rent. That's cool. They're, they're now my friends. They're now my, another client. And so that's what I told him. And, um, and he said, um, so you, you mean tell me, if I gave you $100, we could spend a couple hours together. And I said, I guess so. I've been with you all this time. And plus, i got to wait for early. I've got to wait for dawn to come because I can't get home. And he said, all right, well, that sounds okay with me. He said, where's another place to go? Because we can't, we can't go here. I mean, it's wide open and everything. I said, well, if we go back near the gas stations, there's a campground there. And there's some little places that kind of pull off in the road if you want to go there. He said, okay. So we started cruising down there. And he fixed another drink, and he's smoking another pot. I mean, and he had this thing that this pipe that went into the marijuana, and it just twisted, and then you, I don't know what it's called, but that's what he was doing. He just, I couldn't believe how much he smoked. And I grabbed another beer, and I told him, I said, Oh my God, I forgot to tell you, we get I use rubbers. It's mandatory. And he said, um, 
I said, we might have to stop the gas station and get some rubbers because I don't have any. He said, no, I got some. I said, oh, okay, that's good. So we started down the road, and finally we got to the area. We couldn't see to into the trail, so he asked me to get a flashlight out of the glove box. And so I got a flashlight out of the glove box, and I'm looking around. We finally saw the trail. We went in. You couldn't go too far in at all we were real close to, to the road and cars were going by and you could see so you took a smaller tinier flashlight out of the glove box and put it on the dash um so they wouldn't see the dome light because we were pretty close to the road and then he said well i got an idea how about if if we both do this now we both get undressed so i know that you won't skip out on my money and i said well richard you know I've never rolled a client in my life. I've never skipped out on anybody, but I can understand, I think, what you're saying because I told you I use rubbers and I ain't gonna do it without any rubbers with anybody. I don't care. No exception to the rule. And I'm precautious, so I guess you're being precautious too. So, okay, that sounds fine with me. Is that unusual for you to take off all of your clothes first? No, because I used to do it all the time to let my clients know that I wasn't gonna leave on them or anything, you know. So I was being honest with them. Hey, I'm all right. I'm a good, you know, I'm cool. Uh, so what happened after that? Did you take your clothes off after you had that conversation with him? Well, he started, he told me he had to go back and get some rubbers out of the trunk. He said, don't worry, I'm going to go get some rubbers out of the trunk. I'm going to go get a sleeping bag and a yellow blanket. I mean, eventually I, it was yellow, a blanket. And he was going to put it in the front seat so he wouldn't get anything on the car seat. And so then... He came back. Oh, well, wait a minute. I, yeah, I was undressing then. And I took my bag, I put it over near the hump here, and I started to take off my jeans and stuff. And by the time I was starting to take off my jeans and everything, he came back. I was half undressed, and I was putting my stuff in the back seat. And then I said to him, I helped rearrange the sleeping bag and everything on the seat. I went and took a leak and everything. And then I said to him, I said, well, this ain't fair. I said, we agreed upon both of us get nude. I'm the only one nude. And uh, he turned down the dome light and he said, not bad. And I said, well, I don't know, because I've got a lot of stretch marks in the beer belly and everything. And yeah, I think otherwise sometimes. And then he had this kind of smirk on his face and he said, you'll do, and turns off the dome light. Was and he mad? Huh? Was he mad at you for asking him to take his clothes off? Yeah, I didn't ask him to take his, I, I haven't mm -hmm. asked him yet, I'm starting to now, but okay. I haven't even asked him yet. Okay. And that's the next thing I ask him. I said, okay. I said, well, Richard, why don't you take off your clothes and let's get started because it's cold in here. Because it was really cold outside. And he rolled down his window and he said, yeah, it is cold. I love cold weather. And all this wind, because it was windy out, all this wind's blowing in. So I said, hey, Richard, why don't you close the window, man? It's cold, man. And so he's ignoring me, and he said, he started to act like he was t uh, unbuckling his pants and unbuckling, I mean, unsipping his pants. And he said, what if I don't, told you I don't have enough money? And like, I'm telling you, I don't really care. I was just doing this for a little, I was really just doing this past time, but I wasn't going to do it for free. I got to definitely have to make something out of it because I've got somebody at home I can get my sex from if I need it. And I mean, you know what I'm saying? Okay, so anyways, I said, how much do you have you got? And he said, I've only got a little for breakfast and some for gas. And I said, Richard, I said, no way. I said, I'm not here for my health. I said, we made an agreement. I'm sorry, but I guess we're going to have to just call this off. You know, because he's acting like he don't have any money. So I turned around and I had my clothes on top of some boxes or something that were in the back, something there. I can't remember exactly, but they were on something. And I started to grab them. And as I started to grab my clothes, I saw him coming toward me. And then I was going to turn to look at him. And before I even got a chance to turn to look at him, he whipped a cord around my neck and pulled me toward him. Had you told him at that point, I'm, I'm not going to have sex with you? And you said no? Yes, I told him no way. I said, I'm not here for my health, no way. 
you know, we're going to have to call this off then. Tell us what happened after uh, you fell the court around your neck. Okay, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm really nervous, and I'm really getting pretty shy and embarrassed, and this is hard for me, so just bear with me. And, and, um, he put the cord around my neck, and he said, yes, you are, bitch. He said... You're going to do everything I tell you to do. And if you don't, I'll kill you right now. And I'll fuck you after. Like, just like the other sluts I've done. And. Um, and he said, it doesn't matter to me. Their body, your body will still be warm for my huge. Uh, and he said he was choking me and I was holding it like this and he said do you want to die slut and I just nodded no and then he said are you going you gonna to listen to everything I've got to say have you do and I just nodded yes and he told me to lay down on this car seat so when he told me to lay down, he told me to give me my hands. And so I gave him my, I had to lift up my hands like this, and he tied my hands, and he tied me to the steering wheel. Where is he in, in relation to you at this point? He's sitting in the driver's seat. Is he behind you? I'm laid down like this, with my feet near the window. And okay. He's, and then what happened? Then he got out of the car and told me to slide up, get comfortable, because he's going to see how much meat he can pound in my ass. Feel the incredible softness and warmth. So he walked around from the driver's seat to the passenger side and opened the door and he started to undress and he's thrown his clothes on the floor <laughs> and this is very embarrassing for me so he got in and then he toed, lifted my legs all the way up my feet are near the window okay, what happened next then he decided, he began to start having uh, anal sex. Okay. And he's doing this very violent manner, movement. And then he, I don't know. If he came, or, you know, um, climax. I straw. I talk street talk. So, so I don't know if he did that. <clears throat> and he violently took himself out. And violently put himself in my vagina. Were you saying anything to him at that point? No, I was crying my brains out. Was he saying anything to you? Yes, he was saying that he loved to hear me, the pain, and when I moaned, and he loved to hear my crying, and it turned him on. Okay. Then what happened? Then he, well, he pretty much bruised, like, my cervix and all, and everything else. He got off. He had bruised my ribs and everything else and he got off and he got up took his clothes walked over to the driver's seat and then so he took he put his clothes on the 
hood of the car. He had the door open. Now, went and got the ignition out of the car. Went into the trunk and got something out of the trunk. And he brought it back, and it was a red cooler and a blue tote bag. So, anyway, in this red cooler was two liter bottles. I think they were Pepsi. I don't know, but they were two big bottles full of water, I think. The tote bag had a maroon large towel, something like a white or yellow towel. Had I was turning my head to see what he was doing when I was tied to the steering wheel, and it was straining my neck, so sometimes I had to put my head back down because I couldn't turn it all the way to see what he was doing. And I, at one time I asked him, I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm full of surprises, honey, for you tonight. And I turned my head, kept watching, and the dome light was on, so this is how I saw what was coming out of the bag. And then there was the bar of soap, toothbrush, rubbing alcohol, and a bottle of Visine. So then he, uh, he took the bottle of rubbing alcohol and the bottle of Visine, he put it in front of my face, and he said, this is what this is. And I'm like, what? You know, and he takes the Visine bottle and he puts it on the front of the dash. And he takes rubbing alcohol and puts it with his other stuff. This guy begins to take a bath because he had blood all over his penis. And with some other jazz, which I don't think I should say. Okay. By taking a bath, do you mean he was cleaning himself? He began to take a bath using this water in the bottle. He put rubbing alcohol, I guess. I don't know if it was rubbing alcohol or what, but later he just poured it all over himself and he told, he was saying that the last sluts he had, he, he thought were full of diseases and he always had to clean himself. What happened next? So he's cleaning himself. Okay, sorry about that. Phone ringing. Here we go blowing me away and I said to myself I think this guy is going to kill me he's going to get rid of me or he's I don't know what he's going to do dissect me or something I don't know what he's got in this bag like he's strange he is totally weird so he uh, gets every, everything he gets done cleaning he puts his clothes back on he gets the cooler, brings it back to the trunk, puts in, puts everything in the tote bag, leaves it there. He goes around the passenger side, he grabs a bottle of icing from the dashboard, he goes around the passenger side, and he says, this is one of my surprises. Oh Lord, my ears are ringing, and I'm dizzy a little. Get down for a second, I can wait. Hmm. Okay. All right, so uh, takes the visine and he lifts up my legs and he puts what turns out to be rubbing alcohol in the visine bottle and he sticks some of my rectum area <laughs> and that really hurt really bad because he tore me up for a while and so in my vagina it was really hurt bad. and then he walked around to, back to driver's seat side and he Pulled my nose open like this. Pulled them open and he squirt rubbing alcohol down my nose. And he said, I'm saving your eyes for the grand finale. And he put the visine back on the dash. And I was really pissed. 
And I was just, I didn't care. I was yelling at him and everything else. He was laughing away, saying, that's what I want to hear. I, when you start crying and all that pain. Then he put it there, and there was a few more items on the car. He put it back in the tote bag. Then he put the tote bag back in the trunk. Closed the trunk. Came back. He had this gray radio, a square gray radio, two speakers on it. Went to the back of the seat, got the gray radio. He went around the passenger side, made a drink, because he couldn't get through with me tied to the steering wheel. And then he walked back to the driver's side and went underneath the seat and got his marijuana, got his cigarettes off the dash, and I guess he walked over to the front of the car because I couldn't see where he was. And I felt the car move, and he's just sitting there, and he cranks up the radio. The window is still open in the car. I'm freezing to death. And so he's just sitting out there listening to the radio, and I'm thinking this guy is thinking how he's going to kill me. So I'm trying desperately to get off untied from the steering wheel. I tried 101 times, and he finally even, he even said, I can feel you moving in there. Don't worry, you ain't going to get untied unless I untie you. I didn't care. I kept trying and kept moving my body up like this and pulling and pulling. <sighs> so finally, he came back after about an hour. It must have been an hour or so. It seemed like the longest time. And he said, it's, finally, the cold weather got to me. Do you believe it? I'm getting in. So I'm thinking, how is he going to get in? I'm here. Tied the steering wheel. How can he get in? And he said, I'm going to untie you from the steering wheel. And you better be a good girl. I'll kill you. So he untied me from the steering wheel. <laughs> he untied me and put the rope around my neck and held it like a leash around my neck told me to move over so he could move in. So he moved over. I mean, I moved over. And he moved in. And then closed the door. And he's still saying all kinds of jazz about what he wants to do. So then he told me to Turn toward him, lay down, and spread my legs. He has all of his clothes on. I guess he's just going to sip himself. I don't know. Did you say anything to him, Lee? I didn't say nothing. I was scared. Okay, so then what happened? I may have said something sardonic to him, like, why you just took out your clothes on? Why don't you take your clothes off like you did before? So I don't know. I'm... Don't recall. I may have. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. It's too long ago. Too. It took me long. It was hard enough for me to remember these blackouts because this is a blackout situation that I had to remember. So I don't recall every incident that, every word and all that. That's hard for me to remember. I'm trying to hard my best to even remember everything he did say. And just tell us what you do remember. Okay, okay. So, yeah, he had me turn and he wanted to start having sex with me. And he had the rope. I mean, not the rope. It was a, I later learned it was jacks to a stereo, but it was cut. Where there's only one jack. And so that's how I found out it was jacks to a stereo or something, or TV or something. It was round, gray. So he had, he was holding me like this, like reins. That's when I said, I'm going to grab this. I grabbed it, and it came right out of his hand, I flung it in the back seat. Did you say to him, I'm going to grab this? Or did you, no, my mind. Okay. I said, grab that. 
grab it now, you know, do something, you got to fight. And I, I thought to myself, I got to fight, I'm going to die. This guy is going to play with me and play with me, and then he's going to kill me. He's already said he's going to kill me. He's, he's already said he killed other girls. I got to fight. I just got to fight for my life. Feel the incredible softness. Plus, now I'm, I was close to the area where my, my bag was, where my gun was. Where, where was your, your bag? My bag was near the hump because I had first had it in the right side, but I had to move it because it was in the way for me to get my jeans off. And so I kind of moved it almost on the hump. Actually, it was almost on the hump. I pushed it all, all the way over so I could get room to move and change. That's what I found out. So then, uh, he, I grabbed it, flung it. Yeah, he takes his left arm, he choked him, and I grabbed my, I just, I can't. He just grabbed me like this, and I grabbed my hand up like this, and kept it away. He slapped me really hard in the face and I <laughs> and he started to choke me, but I grabbed his right or left arm, right arm, right arm, yes. And I kept it up and I would take get upward with my feet and I pushed him back. And he kind of quit struggling and just got up on his knees and said, You're gonna be a lot of fun while he was saying that <clears throat> I jumped up real fast and I spit in his face. And he said, You're a dead bitch, you're dead. And he's wiping his eyes. And I laid down real quick and I grabbed my bag. And he was starting to come for, for me when I grabbed my bag and turned, whipped my pistol out toward him. And he was coming toward me with his right arm, I believe. And I shot immediately. And I think I shot twice as fast as I could. And then what'd you do? And he started coming at me again. And I shot. He stopped. I hurried, kind of pushed him away from me. And he kind of sat up on the driver's seat. I hurried, opened the passenger door, ran around the driver's side, opened the door real fast, looked at him, and he started to come out. And I said, don't come out. Don't come near me. I'll shoot. I'll have to shoot you again or something like that. Don't make me have to shoot you again or something like that. He just started coming at me and I shot. And I don't know where I shot him. I just shot him. And he fell on the ground. And then I pulled him away from the car. You want to hear the rest? What happened? What happened after you shot him the last time? I stood there and looked at him. And thought, what I'm going to do with the car? And I said, well, I got to drag him away from the car because he's near the car. I'm going to run him over if I don't move him. So I dragged him away. I got back in the car totally nude. I went to reach for the keys and the ignition to start up. It wasn't there. So I ran back to him and looked in his pockets for his keys, got his keys, went back to the car, started it up, backed up. Headlights turned him on. I turned him on, looking at his body. I went back to him, checked his pulse. He was dead. I saw a carpet in front of him because of the headlights. I said, I don't want the birds to be picking at his body. So I grabbed the carpet and I put it over him. Jumped in the car, backed out, took off nude, went back to quail run. Lee, did you take anything else off? Him when you went into his pockets other than the car keys? No. So you went back to Quail Run? Yes. Why did you go back over to Quail Run? Because I was totally nude and I had to get dressed. And I also had to get my senses together. I was totally crying, shaking, totally cleared out of my mind. And I had to change. I had to get on my clothes and everything. And then when I got there, I realized that I had a little bit of blood on me and stuff. So I went into the trunk and got out the stuff he took out. And I started cleaning myself like he did. And then I put my clothes back on. 
and then I took all the stuff that was in the car and threw it on the floorboard and I took all my stuff and put it on the seat and just sat there wondering what to do, drinking a beer and thinking, what am I going to do? Didn't know what I was going to do. And I said, I'm going to have to lay low. I don't know what I'm going to do, man. I can't get out. I, I'm going to have to drop this car off, whatever. When I saw the radar detector, I said, I'll keep it to pawn it off for food or whatever, because I'm not going to be able to get out on the road now. I'm scared. They're going to find his body. I've got to go and hurry up and dump this car off. What time, of the day, what time is it by this time? This is, I, I remember when I was throwing stuff out. I was throwing a bunch of stuff out in the woods, just kept on throwing. But now in Quail Run, I drove to another area. I stopped again and I threw a bunch of stuff out in the woods and I noticed his watch and I checked it and it was 6.30 in the morning. When, when do you uh, last remember in terms of time that, that he was alive? I don't know how long. See, I didn't know what time it was. All I know is he was out there sitting in the car on the hood for about an hour, and I never, never got to know what time it was. All right, so what did you do after that, after you noticed what time it was? I said, I've got to hurry up and get back to Ty. I'm going to, I'm tired. I'm beat up. I'm hurting all over. My crotch hurts. My vagina hurts. My nose hurts. I'm freaking out. I've got to go take a shower. I mean, these are the things that are going through my mind, you know, as I'm sitting there. I've got to, I got to, I got to hurry up and get rid of this car, go back home, take a shower, hurry up and get this car. I was going to take it to the car wash, wash it, and go drop it off somewhere to get rid of all my prints. I'm so scared now because I just had I have to kill this guy. And I don't know what to do. What did you do? Well, I went back home. When I got home, I, that my plan was to go to the car wash, wash the car off and everything else and get rid of it. When I got there, Maggie, my dog Maggie and my cat Tyler, Maggie tore the chair all to shreds. She chews carpets too and she chewed the carpet all to shreds, tore the curtains and the blinds and all of it. So I when I knocked on the door and Ty opened the door for me, and I saw this, I said, what is this? And she said, I don't know, Maggie and Tyler just got crazy. I, I was at work. I said, oh, my God. And I just realized, you know, that I've got this guy's car. The man, I, we're supposed to move that day. It, it totally a coincidence that we were moving that day. We had three people that were going to move us at the around 5 o'clock after Ty got out. And I said, Man, if the manager sees this, he's going to call the cops. He's going to have cops here. I've got the car here, everything. I've got to get rid of the car and everything. So I said, Are you, I, all the boxes, were, everything was ready to move. And I said, let's, let's move now. I've got a guy loaned me a car like that, I said to her. And I said, he's waiting at a motel. He's going to let us keep it for just a couple hours to move. I just said it like that. And I told her to call Jane and tell her we're coming over just to hurry up and get out of that room because it was totally destroyed. And then she said, what are those hickeys on your neck? And I said, what are you talking about? And so I walked into the bathroom and I looked and I said, oh, no, I must have slapped a mosquito real hard or something. I was trying to ignore it and she kept asking me. She said, I told you, don't you ever go out there with those hickeys on? I mean, get a hickey out there out when you're out in the road. And I told her, I said, they're not hickeys, don't worry. I just slapped a mosquito too hard or something. I don't know what it is. And then we just, that was the end of that. And then we hurried up and got the stuff in and we just left. What did you finally do with uh, Richard Mallory's car? Okay, when we got to the new apartment, I hurried up, we put our stuff in. I had to hurry up and go to work. I had to go right back to the motel. She had to pick up the moped. My, tw I think it was 12 speed. My 12 speed was there too. The moped and 12 speed worked together. I decided to put the 12 speed in the back of the trunk and she took the moped, went to work. I went to the car wash, hurried up and washed the car, cleaned it out. Then I went down John Anderson, went up to a place uh, to park it and I took the bicycle out and I was going to ride home and I was cleaning the car out and make sure about prints. I forgot the glove box and that's where his, I found his wallet underneath the seat and I went through it 
to find out who he, if he really was Richard or what his name was and that. And a bunch of credit cards and everything else. And I just threw it in the glove box. And as I was wiping down, I remember the glove, I opened up and I said, oh, oh, God, I forgot to throw this out. So I went in the back of the car, dug a hole, and I put it there. And then I found this darn vodka bottle was underneath the seat. And a couple more glasses were underneath the seat that I didn't notice. So I took them out, put them on. So I started checking on the seat really good to get everything. And I was finding, like, like pens and those final business cards and stuff. And I was just throwing them. I didn't really know what I was doing. When I got done burying the wallet and the glass and the, the vodka bottle in it and the glass and stuff, the stuff else, what I was finding in the car, I was just throwing. I didn't even, you know, just, just throwing the stuff out. Which, see, I didn't know what I was doing here. I was doing this to bury for prints to make sure my prints were on there. Then I was throwing stuff out. So I didn't have. Did you take anything out of uh, Richard Bauer's wallet when you were going through it? He only had about $38 or 42 or 48 something like that. It wasn't very much money. Did you take it? Yes. Did you take any credit cards? No. What did you do after you finished throwing things into the woods? When I got on my bicycle, I started riding and I just threw the keys into, the, into somebody's yard or something. It was like a bush or something. I just threw them. Went back home. That's it. I just went home. Lee, did you make it clear to men that picked you up that you would not have sex with them without money? Well, I had two guys had sex with me without money once, and I didn't do anything to them, and I had my gun with me. And they just never used a weapon on me. They never hurt me. They weren't really physical or anything on me. They just didn't want me to go unless they had sex. But, uh, basically, I told them, you know, I don't do it without money. I have a long time. Yeah, Oh my God, look at this jury. Is this not crazy? <coughs> Seeing them? So weird. <laughs> oh, look at this one juror right here. That's an old lady. She's probably like, oh, my God, hearing that story. Well, have you ever been convicted of a felony? Yes, ma'am. How many times? One time. Had you ever had uh, anal sex prior to this time uh, with Richard Mallory? Never in my life. I always told my clients I don't do anything kinky, anything dirty or nasty. Always decent, clean. When Mallory started getting violent with you, did you try to calm him down? Did you try to talk yeah, to him down? Did you say anything to Mr. Mallory when he was trying to get violent? I, I didn't. I couldn't. He was choking me so hard that the blood was running to my head and spots were before my eyes. I couldn't talk. All I could do was hope I was trying to get the court not to be. I have nothing for anybody. Wow. Well, that was part one of direct from the defense putting her on the stand. Uh, I need to dig through and see if, if there was, I'm sure there was a coroner's report. Um, there's a lot of clips, so I'm going to have to find out 
which one and look at the coroner and see if they did a toxicology on him, on uh, Richard. Because she was saying he's just smoking all this weed, he's drinking all of this, you know, he's drinking, he's smoking, and she's like, can't believe how much he's, he's smoking. Um, one thing that did stand out is the, the bag on the hump. If y'all recall when she was first talking about getting in the car, uh, she, it was either when she first put, got in the car or when she started to take her clothes off, she had put her bag near the hump in the middle of the, the front seat area. Now, we know when you start telling lies, it's hard to keep it. Well, you know, right? It's hard to keep lies, keep keep this, keep the lies going and being referred back if you're making it up as you go. Unless she just concocted this and worked on it. But I did notice she said the hump. She put the bag at the hump, and then after the whole ordeal, she realizes her bag is still at the hump while she's still tied to the, the steering wheel, supposedly. And then, and then eventually she's able to grab her gun because her bag is right there. I mean, that, that kind of stood out. But we know her, her story has changed from this to you saw the videos where she came clean if you haven't i am going to do another video where she does these interviews um where she she wanted to come clean she wanted to say that none of this was uh none of the killings were self-defense she did it she wants to own up to it she doesn't want to go into the execution chamber and die without coming clean then she does another interview, I believe it was the day before she was going to be executed, and and she was uh, odd, it, it was like different, she didn't want to talk about her changing her story, she wanted to focus on uh, conspiracy theory stuff, now keep in mind she had been in solitary confinement probably a decade, I don't know, long time, long time, no, no human stimulation, uh, she'd get out an hour a day. Plus, she's already crazy, right? And then, and then on top of that, building on her psychosis. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what to believe. I saw a um, another post. It was uh, interesting things to know about serial killers. And on a uh, psychic chart, they got some kind of chart um, where Ted Bundy scored a 39 out of 40. And she scored on this. There, there's some kind of test that they, they gave her. She scored a 32 on being a psychopath. Some kind of psychopathic score chart, whatever. But. I'm not surprised Ted Bundy scored so high. I'm surprised he didn't get a 40 across the board. But she scored a 32 as being psychopathic. So psychopathic on top of uh, she's got some loony problems. Um, I, I still right now, even this far into this trial, and there's still so much I haven't seen of the tr trial itself. Like I said, I've just only watched... Um, documentaries but uh i don't think they should have executed her they should have put her in a in a mental institution and observe and you know kept an eye on her i mean she she wanted to die she she gave up all her uh uh pleas and all that stuff to uh her appeals and pleads for appeals and uh wanted to go ahead and get executed I guess she didn't realize once she got off death row, she'd get out of solitary confinement. I would somebody probably would have told her that. I don't know because I, I'm thinking in her psychosis, she's thinking she's going to have to spend her life in a cell for 23 hours a day. You know, if she got life, she'd have been put into a uh, prison population. I think that Christian woman that adopted her had, t had pl pled with her not to do this, that she could do good for other inmates that are troubled, but obviously Elaine wasn't having it. Well, 
those are my thoughts. Uh, it's kind of hard believing her, obviously, uh, because of what I know now. But if I was just watching this trial, let's say, back then, we don't know crap about her. I mean, it was, it was some crazy testimony right there. Her giving this big, long, drawn-out story. But I'm not a body language expert, and that's another video I probably need to, to, to do this. The body language guys that did one on her, uh, so I haven't seen that, but that might be interesting. Well, there you have it. If you made it to the end, thank you for joining me. I hope y'all enjoyed it. I actually found it very interesting and fascinating. I always do with, with these kinds of cases. But um, I appreciate it if you made it to the end. And thank you so much. And have a wonderful day. Peace.